first of all, you got to appreciate I was raised on a farm. Right. And my grandfather had the homestead in Montana that he's homesteaded in 1915. Neither our farm in Jasper County or the homestead in Montana had electricity or running water, which translated into the functional tools that you need in life is we didn't have a bathtub. We didn't have a toilet, a flush mm -hmm. toilet. Mm -hmm. And there was no switch on the wall t t for air conditioning or heat. Mm -hmm. um, and there was no switch on the wall for a light. So we read by kerosene lanterns at, at, at night. Um, uh, I did my studies. One of the reasons my eyes are so bad today is because all of my studies, except for that year I was in Washington, were done with a kerosene lantern. And when you wanted heat, you uh, you put coal or wood or into the into the big pot bellied stove that sat in the middle of the house mm -hmm. with pipes running everywhere. If you needed to relieve yourself, you went to the to the outhouse or the privy that was mm, about um, about a hundred feet out the back door. Um, you went to Grandma's house in town mm -hmm. Saturday nights to take a bath, and um, if you wanted air conditioning, you opened the window. Mm -hmm. um, I was, uh, and it, when you're raised on a on a hard scrabble farm, uh, you 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 you're in contact with the soil with animals every day. Uh, you worry about, and you really watch uh, uh, the weather. Mm -hmm. Uh, that becomes innate to know what the weather is going to be because it helps you plan your day and your week in terms of working in the fields. When you're going to cut hay, when you're going to plant corn, blah, blah, blah. Um, my grandfather uh, loved uh, nature and he was quite a sportsman. And so he would take me uh, rabbit hunting with him, squirrel hunting, fishing. And then I would go, starting when I was six, out to his ranch in Montana, mm -hmm. where we would ride horses in the mountains and um, and um, really engage with nature mm -hmm. in a in a fearsome way. He was a, quite a hunter, as I said, uh, and uh, you, you just you, you were you were just nature. That was the world you lived in, right? With the natural world around you. That's what you harvested for food, whether it would be acorns uh, or walnuts or, or whether you shot squirrels or rabbits or deer, um, et cetera, et cetera. So I was raised in, 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 an, in, in nature. We really was raised in it. And it's been a part of me my whole life. Uh, uh, I seek solitude in nature and I'm more comfortable in nature actually than I am uh, with people. Mm -hmm. um, surprising as that may sound. But when you get so close to, and, and then in my adult life, I continued, grandfather unfortunately died when I was 16. Um, but in my adult life, I became a, a fairly serious hunter. Mm -hmm. And I hunted uh, from the Arctic Circle all the way down into, into Mexico. Uh, I hunted uh, in uh, Mongolia. Uh, uh, the state of Georgia and Russia, Azerbaijan and Tajikistan. These are all rural mountain areas. But from so much time in the in the bush, as we call it, you you developed an appreciation for the problems that man has created hmm. in the interface with the natural world. Uh, I was so shocked when I went to Asia the first time because the hillsides were all eaten off by domestic livestock. Hmm. They left no forage for the animal, for the wild animals. And as man expanded in Asia, they moved the herds further and further and further into the wilderness. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden the habitat for our wild animals were gone. Hmm. And also they would shoot them at any season. They had no concept of seasons or bag limits or anything, but they shot them for food, hmm. period. And what all of that field experience taught me was that someone had to speak up for the animals and their habitats. Mm -hmm. And early in the 70s, 
uh, uh, well, let me back up. In the 60s and 70s was a very expansionist period in the United States in the environmental movement and um, um, in the consumer protection era. Mm -hmm. And we had 22 major laws passed between the early 60s and the late 70s that all were either environmental conservation or consumer protection laws. It's a great, great period of uh, fervor and, uh, and uh, um, opportunity for environmental stewardship back then. The sportsman's community took note of that, and I was very much part of the sportsman's community in the 60s. I graduated here in, from Valpo in 61 and then my law school in 64. And shortly behind that period, was the rise of the of, of, of the sportsmen's communities organizations. Um, I was one of the founders of the Foundation for North American Wild Sheep, which is today called uh, the Wild Sheep Foundation. Mm -hmm. Other groups formed during that period, like uh, the, the the Elk Foundation, mm -hmm. the Mule Deer Foundation, uh, Pheasants Forever, Quail Forever. Um, uh, and others that mm -hmm. will come to me in a minute. Now, I'm sitting as a lawyer in Washington, D.C. during that period, and all of these formative groups that were forming, and I was a part of many of them just as a member. I wasn't as active with many as I was with the Bow Sheep Foundation in its, in its organization, in its growth, and in its governance. Um, but when they looked to Washington for problems, because they all knew me and I was an attorney there, mm -hmm. they would call me and ask for counsel, for help, how do we deal with this regulation? How do we deal with this proposed new law? And uh, so I found myself with them frequently, or alone, um, before Congress, mm -hmm. uh, or before an administrative agency like the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, or the Bureau of Land Management, or the National Park Service, etc., to advocate on behalf of one of the groups. Mm -hmm. And before I knew it, uh, and this was all pro bono work, but before I knew it, I became an advocate, mm -hmm. just by default, mm -hmm. because there was no one else on deck in Washington that A, was a sportsman, that B, had the field experience that I did, that could talk intelligently about the real problems, because I understood them, having spent so much time in the, in the field. Mm -hmm. um, and it has continued throughout my life. Mm -hmm. uh, today, I spend uh, probably... 95% of my, of my time, seven days a week, uh, in the wildlife conservation arena, mm -hmm. in many different facets. During this period, mm -hmm. I'm still asking, you know, my Christian self voice is still asking back here, what should you be doing with your life, right, what's your right. calling? And I finally realized <laughs> I've been doing it all, all my life, that's my calling. And um, uh, uh, because I do it not for myself, but for the nation and for the for the betterment of, of, of our critters and our and, and, and their habitats. Right.